Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Grand Rounds. We're delighted to have our very own Dr. Anna Wald as today's speaker. Dr. Wald is originally from Poland and received her MD at Mount Sinai in New York, as well as an MPH at the University of Washington. She did a residency at Boston University and an ID fellowship at the, at the UW prior to joining the faculty. Today, she holds the position of professor in the Division of Allergy and ID, as well as a joint appointment with the School of Public Health, and serves as a consult attending at Harborview and the SCCA, as well as the medical director of the UW Virology Research Clinic. She's co-investigator or PI on several NIH-funded grants, all studying uh, HSV and other viral infections, and is also participating in a number of clinical trials in that area. She's published a book on herpes and the management of it, and more than 200 peer-reviewed articles on the subject and other related topics. Please welcome Dr. Wald as she gives her talk entitled Injecting Hope, HSV Vaccine for Functional Cure and Prevention. Thank you, Dr. Wald. Good morning, um, and thank you for uh, inviting me to give uh, this grand rounds and tell you about what I've been doing for the last uh, 10 or so years. Uh, today's actually an important year, or rather this year's an important year. I've been at this institution now for 25 years. Um, and this is my third time giving grand rounds. So I figure in another decade, maybe I'll come back and give you my last grand rounds. Okay, so I'm going to start with my disclosures. Most of my funding comes from uh, NIH, but I do work with drug companies. Uh, in particular, I work with companies uh, that are trying to make an HSV vaccine, and these are bolded here, um, as well as others who make um, products, either diagnostic or therapeutic products, for viral infections. And I'm a consultant to iCurus, who has a, uh, is a company that has a new herpes drug that I will not be talking about. There are going to be three parts to my talk. I will first talk about host pathogen interactions uh, between HSV and the human host. Then I will discuss a therapeutic vaccine and where we are with making of one and what are the uh, challenges. And then I will talk about a prophylactic vaccine. And I will explain what those terms mean uh, when I get uh, to them. So there's clearly an unmet medical need to have a vaccine for HSV-2. Um, HSV-2 is the main cause of genital ulcer disease worldwide, and there's a very strong synergy between HSV-2 and HIV. So worldwide, when people have HSV-2, they are much more likely to acquire HIV upon exposure. So for example, for a men, it's 2.7 times higher risk, for women, three times and it's also increased for men who have sex with men. So that means that HSV-2 is one of the main drivers of um, HIV epidemic, especially in areas such as Sub-Saharan Africa, where, as you will see, the prevalence rates for HSV-2, even in general population, may exceed uh, 50%. There is also the issue of neonatal herpes. Neonatal herpes, um, the estimates for the United States are about 2,000 cases per year, and there are no prevention strategies at this point that have been implemented. So overall, when you look at the global burden, the most uh, recent estimate that I could find is about 500 million prevalent cases uh, worldwide. Now, I don't really want to skip HSV-1 uh, for many reasons. One of them is because there are lots of interactions between the two viruses that are epidemiologically uh, and probably immunologically very important. But also HSV-1 has emerged as the uh, most common cause now of first episode genital herpes in the United States. So it used to be HSV-2 and now more than 50% are HSV-1. And it now accounts for about 50% of neonatal herpes. And actually, uh, infants that get disseminated HSV-1 are even more likely to die than those with HSV-2. It is the main cause, of course, of cold sores, which a lot of people uh, find uh, troubling. And is uh, very large because most of the world, and in many places such as Asia and Africa, 100% of people have HSV-1 um, infection. So what has um, driven my research is really what patients want to know. And patients want to know, why is my herpes so bad? Uh, how can I prevent transmission to my uh, partners? 
And our group has focused around these questions on trying to delineate the natural history and then apply it both to drug development and to uh, vaccine uh, development. So just to quickly review what HSV does once it infects somebody, and you can see there is an initial infection at the skin. Then the virus travels up to sacral ganglia, where it replicates further. And then it comes down to cause the primary outbreak. The incubation period is pretty short, about four days. So in general, people can tell you who gave them genital herpes when they come in with the first episode. And then the virus goes back up. And then it comes down again. And one of the main questions that we have been trying to figure out is how often this happens, this travel back and forth. What are the symptoms, if any, that are associated with it? And it turns out that most of it is asymptomatic. And how uh, can we interrupt uh, the retrograde and then the enterograde uh, travel of um, HSV? Now, there's enormous variability in how often the virus is present in the genital tract, but overall in the population, it's about um, 12 to 15 percent of the time. So let's talk a little bit about what does the host do in response. So you can see here on um, this slide that this is an HNE of normal skin. This is a um, biopsy of genital skin. And you can see here uh, that there's an ulcer. And under this ulceration and disrupted epithelium, you can see a dense infiltrate of immune cells. And it turns out that a lot of them are CD8 cells, so you can see them stained here in green, and uh, the HSV is shown in, um, in red. So that's a typical uh, immune response to a herpes uh, lesion. Now, um, here, um, my uh, colleague, Christine Johnson, likes to play this song when she gives uh, a talk on herpes. And you can see why, because when we look at the nerves that are in the uh, skin, and you can see that at the end of them, uh, we have these CD8 cells that stay there for a long time, even on antiviral therapy. And they may be doing a surveillance role. And so that once you have HSV infection in your genital tract, it appears that the immune milieu of that area is probably permanently changed. And you can see here on this biopsy, this was obtained during what we call asymptomatic viral shedding, meaning that we can detect the virus on the skin surface, but the patient has no symptoms and there are no lesions. And it may be too much light here, but I hope you can see that the epithelium here is completely intact. Thank you. It's completely intact. And um, you can see here that even so, there's a pretty dense infiltrate of CD8 T cells. So this is a biopsy obtained on a patient who had asymptomatic shedding at the time. Obviously, this is a risk for transmission to sexual partners, and yet they were um, asymptomatic. We're, of course, not the only group who has pointed this out. These are data from Rakai uh, from Uganda. And the Rakai investigators um, have done a lot of uh, circumcisions. And these are slides showing the infiltrate in foreskins of uh, men who've been uh, circumcised as part of their clinical trial. And you can see, for example, here that in patients that have HSV2, there's a lot more red dots and even more red dots in patients who have both HIV and HSV2. So that HSV2 infection is associated with a um, two-fold higher increase in inflammatory cells, and then HIV infection further um, accentuates um, that infiltrate. Now, one of the questions that we've been trying to ask is what happens to those cells uh, in the long run, and what is their role? And uh, Jaju, who works um, in the herpes group, has shown um, that these cells have a, um, are alpha-alpha cells, which are thought to be surveillance cells. And this is really the first time that they have been shown in a human um, herpes virus infection to persist long-term in the genital tissue. Uh, these cells express an activated antiviral signature when you look at the gene expression. And there are oligoclonals suggesting that maybe we can identify what are the epitopes that these cells uh, respond to. 
Now, in my clinic, we have developed a method of assessing severity of HSV infection that I think is pretty uh, objective. We draw patient's blood, so we establish by the Western blot, which is the most accurate test for antibodies for HSV-1 or 2, whether the patient has just HSV-1, just HSV-2, or both HSV-1 and HSV-2. And then we teach the patients how to collect swabs of their genital area on a daily basis. So they get this kit uh, that includes vials and swabs, and they also get a, a page of diary on which they write down uh, their symptoms and their lesions. And they swab every day, and then they bring the swabs in, and that goes to the laboratory where it's tested by um, HSV DNA PCR, which is a very sensitive and specific test. Now, we have um, found that we can actually trust our participants to do a good job in these studies, and um, the yield of the virus is higher when we compare swabs obtained at home by the patients to swabs that we obtain in the clinic. Uh, so this is definitely the most sensitive way of doing it. Um, and we have now done it both in natural history studies as well as in studies of antivirals. And this is just to show you that initially um, we asked patients to swab once a day and then we um, upped the ante and asked them to swab four times a day. And in fact, we, I thought, got incredible compliance on 74% of the days. We've obtained all four swabs. And you can see here some of the patterns. So each bar here represents a quarter of the day. So this um, patient on that day only had virus detected during one of those six-hour periods during which they swabbed. So it is a very rapid on and off switch uh, that you can see. Sometimes, somehow, the off switch fails, and as you can see, the virus is present for many days uh, in a row. And then sometimes it's somewhere in the middle. And these patterns vary dramatically between people, but all of the shed most of the shedding is asymptomatic. And you can see some other uh, patterns here. You can see the variability both in frequency and duration between people, and also in magnitude. And it's really only these very uh, high, titered, prolonged episodes that result in genital lesions. So out of these three patients that you can see here, uh, really lesion, a typical genital lesion was only present during this time. So we now have a method to define objectively the virologic severity of the disease. And it turns out that when we swab people a couple years apart, a couple months apart, they actually stay true to themselves. Uh, so this allows us to define people as having a certain shedding rate which represents their set point in the uh, pathogen um, host interaction. And here you can just see that this has helped us define that the currently available drugs, while they're very good for amelioration of symptoms, uh, actually are not that effective for completely abrogating viral shedding because um, as shown here in Christine Johnson's paper, uh, even on valacyclovir or acyclovir, there's quite a lot of breakthrough shedding, which I think explains why in the valacyclovir transmission study, people who are giving uh, daily valacyclovir reduce their risk of transmitting HSV2 to their susceptible partner only by 50%, and we were actually hoping for a much uh, higher result. So just to summarize what we know about HSV host interactions that is relevant to vaccine development, um, clearly people have universal but variable susceptibility. There's a wide spectrum of disease. Now it turns out, and I'll come back to this at the end, that HSV1 doesn't protect you against HSV2, but if you were lucky or unlucky enough to get HSV2 first, we actually don't see HSV1 acquisition in HSV2 seropositive people. So that relationship is not symmetrical. We know that once you're infected, you're obviously not protected because you reactivate. So it doesn't protect you from uh, subsequent clinical or subclinical uh, viral replication. However, there's some data that neutralizing antibody may be protective because women who have established um, HSV infection are much less likely to transmit to their neonates um, if they just acquired infection right before birth and don't yet have antibodies. 
But we also know from patient populations that cell-mediated immunity is very important because it's in patients who lack cell-mediated immunity, such as transplant patients or patients with advanced HIV infection, it's in those patients that we see very bad um, HSV disease. And what is not clear in the slides that I've shown you, showing this uh, response, is whether this response is actually protective or whether it's an epiphenomenon resulting from the immune cells traveling to the site where there's viral reactivation. And of course, it could also be uh, both. It may be a bit of a chicken uh, or the egg uh, question. So now I wanted to uh, talk about HSV vaccines, and this is a, a headline from the Science News uh, by John Cohen, painful failure of promising a genital herpes vaccine. This refers to the Herpavac vaccine that I will discuss um, in some detail um, in a moment. So when we talk about failure, one should think that we've tried really many, many times uh, for such a prevalent infection. So every year I did this search where I looked to see really how many times have people tried. Um, and when you do the search, and I just did it earlier this month, um, in this category, every year there's a few hundred more. But then as you keep coming down, there's really very few new publications. So this 10 has been pretty steady for the last several years. And it's also only 10. And six of them refer to a therapeutic vaccine. And only four of them are prophylactic vaccine. So we've really only done four prophylactic HSV vaccine trials. So maybe it's not so surprising that we don't have um, a candidate that works quite yet. We're all, of course, very jealous of the HPV people, um, which have incredible, um, that vaccine is just incredible, but, you know, we, do, we work with what we got, okay? So I wanted to draw some parallels between HSV and varicella zoster. They are both um, human alpha herpes viruses. So can we learn anything from the success of the um, varicella vaccines? So unlike, or rather similar to HSV, uh, there are two kinds of disease that um, varicella causes. There's an acquisition which results in chicken pox. So that's the primary infection. And then uh, there's reactivation. Of course, shingles may happen once, very rarely twice in somebody's lifetime, and HSV2, as I've shown you, reactivates all the time. So there are clearly some differences, but the pattern is somewhat similar. Now we know that for acquisition, it's the antibody-based immunity, the humoral immunity that is important, and we know that because if we want to prevent chickenpox in the naive host, we can give them VZIG, which is, uh, which is high titer antibodies, and it will prevent development of disease. And we also know that uh, infants rarely develop chicken pox, even after exposure in the first few months of life, because they most of the time get maternal antibodies that protect them. So antibody seems to be important for protection against acquisition. Now what about reactivation or shingles? Well, here it turns out that we need to look at cell-mediated immunity for control of um, VZV reactivation. And we do have an effective therapeutic um, vaccine that boosts cell-mediated immunity, and that we know from immunologic studies is this boost that results in uh, prevention of reactivation and uh, reduction in the incidence of uh, shingles. Now, the other interesting thing about uh, varicella is that we don't really have an animal model um, which we can study. And that is, um, in general, we think that's a bad thing. And I would actually argue that maybe that's a good thing, and maybe that has helped the development of the vaccine, because all the studies had to be done directly on humans. Now, it turns out with herpes is that the animal models have, um, there are several of them, most often it's the mouse or the guinea pig that is used, but unfortunately, they have been shown to be uh, not at all reliable and not predictive of human disease. HSV has co-evolved with humans over millions of years, and it has a lot of immune evasion mechanisms which do not operate in an animal model. So the vaccines that have been tried and work, and really every vaccine tried works great in a mouse, have uh, pretty consistently failed in people 
suggesting that maybe people should stop immunizing mice. Okay. So can we make a therapeutic vaccine for HSV2? Well, we have a successful zoster vaccine, so a cousin uh, virus. Why would we want one? Well, if we had an effective one, we could, uh, first of all, provide relief from recurrences and symptoms and reduce risk of transmission if we can contain viral shedding. So that means that this vaccine could really result in what we call in the HIV field a functional cure where the person may have latent virus, but the latent virus does not reactivate, and therefore they could uh, really not be affected in any way by this disease. So there have been six studies that have been published. Um, there have been three prior uh, candidates that have been interesting and similar to the ones uh, that we are studying now. They have failed, though the one showed transient efficacy. There are also, in the literature, several open-label, uncontrolled studies that show that various therapeutic vaccines work. Um, these are variously referred to as the Russian vaccine or the Bulgarian vaccine. And I'm also from Eastern Europe, so I can say offensive things about Eastern Europeans. Um, but, and I get a lot of patients who email me from all over the world and say, oh, I went and got this vaccine in Moscow and my herpes has gone away. Unfortunately, two years later, when the reality sets in, most of them write back and said, well, maybe it didn't really work that well. Do you have anything else I could try? Okay, so there's some discrepancy between how these vaccines have been tested and uh, what I think is the reality of the biology of this disease. So one of the questions that we've wanted to ask is can we develop an objective approach to measuring disease severity and um, vaccine efficacy? And this is the design of a proof of concept therapeutic vaccine trial um, that we have um, come up with. So you can see here that we take people who are infected and we have them collect swabs of their genital area uh, for 30 to uh, 60 days. Then we give them the vaccine and of course the exact regimen varies with the product. And then again they collect the swabs and we can assess their follow-up shedding rate. Throughout the study, we uh, do immune monitoring to see um, what, is, what is happening to their uh, immune response. And then we can also look at longer-term follow-up, which we need to do, of course, for safety, but also for uh, the durability. So how long does this effect on shedding um, persist? Now, the exact timing of where this is done will vary with the product and actually with the company uh, that we're working with, but this has been the prototypical outline that we have been using. Now, because patients stay true to who they are, uh, this is a one-way crossover study. So people first are assessed before they get vaccinated, they get vaccinated, and then they're assessed after they get vaccinated. And the primary comparison is before and after. In general, crossover studies for various things are not that recommended. Uh, they have some biases uh, that can be brought forth. However, because we're assessing viral shedding, which the patient really has no inkling about when they're collecting the swab, um, I don't think that this um, design will, de will be problematic with response to biases. And I have data to actually show you that. So in general, we like to uh, enroll healthy men and women, 18 to 50, because after 50, we have immunosenescence. And uh, we are usually not included in um, early vaccine studies. We want the patients to have laboratory documented HSV2 infection, because not everybody who thinks they have gentle herpes really has it. And we want them to have it for more than one year, at which point the set point of the interaction between the virus and the host has been established and people really start shedding at their rate that is likely to persist for the next decade or so. Because of the FDA wanting to have a clinical endpoint, we actually want them to have a clinical history of genital herpes so we can also look at the frequency of their lesions. But we don't want them to have very severe disease because those people may be outliers and they may be somehow immunologically different than the majority of population with this infection. And of course, they have to be uh, willing uh, participants in what we ask them to do. So the one um, vaccine that is furthest along in development thus far is the Genosha product. 
And this vaccine has three components. It has uh, the peptide for ICP-4, which is a T cell uh, target. So it stimulates um, cell-mediated immunity. It has glycoprotein D2, and glycoprotein D2 is the main uh, neutralizing um, target for both HSV1 and HSV2, and we'll come back to glycoprotein uh, D2 because it's actually a, it turns out to be pretty important. And then they have a proprietary adjuvant, which is a soponin, so soap-like uh, compound that is thought to boost the immune response. And then preclinical studies, which of course people have to do, uh, in the guinea pig, it reduced shedding, reduced severity of disease, and it generated both a CD4 and CD8 T cell response, which for a therapeutic vaccine, we think might be important. So the clinical objectives of this study, uh, the primary objective was to assess safety because they did a combined phase one, phase two proof of concept um, study to get an idea whether the development of this product should proceed. Um, the, however, the efficacy uh, objectives, the first one was the effect of uh, Gen 003 on HSV2 shedding. We also, of course, looked at the immunological endpoints and whether or not this adjuvant promoted a good response. And that's important because this adjuvant is not FDA approved and one has to show uh, that it adds to the um, efficacy of the product. <coughs> Uh, this was a double-blind, placebo-controlled um, trial, and in each dose, uh, people either got 10, 30, or 100 uh, micrograms of each of the protein. There are about 50 uh, subjects per dose cohort, and 30 of them uh, received the active vaccine. 10 of them received just the protein without the adjuvant, and uh, 10 of them received placebo. So they crossed over after receiving placebo, and everybody did shedding both before and after. In this study, the dose of the adjuvant was constant, um, and of course, people were closely followed for safety. So as you can see here, the study enrolled a pretty typical population that we um, look at with gentle herpes, mostly women, although we did enroll men mean age, mid-30s, uh, predominantly white, but a fairly good representation of uh, people of color as well. Now, one of the neat things about looking at viral shedding as an outcome is that you can look at not very many people. So this entire study enrolled 143 participants, okay? And as you can see, because they were very closely monitored, and because they had so many things to do and so many visits, we actually lost very few. So we have almost complete ascertainment about what happened to the people that were randomized, which is incredibly important for the internal validity um, of the study. Now, of course, safety with these products is very important. And you can see here that when we look at people who received the uh, vaccine with the adjuvant, there was a fair amount of grade three reactogenicity reactions, so people had uh, fevers, myalgia, and local pain. You can see that there was less of it in people who just received the protein without adjuvant. And of course, there was some even with placebo that had uh, no active ingredients. However, you can see that there was no relationship here between the doses of the protein once you looked only at those that received both protein and the adjuvant. So whether the protein was 10, 30, or 100 uh, micrograms, it didn't matter. In fact, most of the reactogenicity was in the 10. And also, as we continue to give them shots, the amount of people with bad reactions didn't increase. So once you had a bad reaction, uh, it didn't mean that it's going to get worse which of the shots, which is very important for keeping people in the study, and also for development of this vaccine as a tenable commercial product, especially if boosters are um, needed. And we had uh, really no related uh, AEs of uh, concern. Now, these are the efficacy data. So I'm going to walk you through this. You can see that there is the placebo group. That's probably the easiest one to look at first. The mean baseline rate of shedding, so the proportion of days on which we recovered virus was about 12%. And after shedding, it was about 13%. 
So it's very nice to have this placebo group because it assures us that the population acts like they should. And they stay really true to themselves on the average. So there was a mean change uh, relative to the baseline of plus 12%, which of course was not statistically significant. And the vaccine without the adjuvant acted similarly. This group had lower shedding rates, uh, but it didn't change much after the vaccination. Now, when you start looking at the adjuvant vaccine, we look at the 10 micrograms, 30, and 100. And you can see here in the 30 micrograms that this group had a viral um, recovery rate of 13.5% prior to vaccination and 66 .6 after. So there was a 50% reduction in viral shedding, which was highly statistically significant um, after vaccination. And this group of 100 had also a 30%, and both of these were statistically significant and resulted both in a reduction in amount of virus and not just the frequency of um, virus. So this is really the first time that we have shown that we can manipulate the immune response to HSV uh, and improve on it. So we are improving upon uh, we, the people naturally control this infection. We now have six months data as well, and there is a statistically significant effect on the number of days with lesions, so it has a clinical effect as well. And we're in the process of looking more carefully at the long-term data and looking at the durability uh, of this effect. So this is obviously very exciting, and this is just to show you. So this is what happened in placebo. Each bar here is a separate person, and you can see the percent change in their shedding rate before and after. So on the average, you can see that there's just as much red um, before as there is um, afterwards. So there's really no change overall be from before to after vaccination. However, when we look at the groups that received the active product, you can see that a lot more people had less shedding. I think these are important ways to look at this because this is a dynamic system we're evaluating, and there's variability between people. But uh, still, this approach, when we look at a group, lets us, I think, infer uh, where sort of the truth uh, lies in terms of the uh, response. There are other therapeutic vaccines uh, that are uh, currently in uh, clinical trials. One of them is by a company called Agenis, and their phase two study showed a 17% reduction in viral shedding, which was also highly statistically significant. Uh, so we have to look at the data a little bit further. And Vical has a DNA vaccine, which is just, uh, we just started their clinical trial. And then uh, Cordon and uh, Sanofi Pasteur also have products in which they want to explore further for a therapeutic use. And um, I think thus far it looks like many of the companies will be using this viral shedding approach to uh, show their um, proof of concept um, study whether or not this vaccine works. So I think we've established the framework for how to do this. Uh, our results from some of the compounds appear uh, promising. We hope to be able to fish out the immune correlate uh, so be able to look at the immune responses and say what predicted a good shedding response. And of course, the durability will be an issue that has to be addressed in further studies. Now, companies are not that interested right now in a prophylactic vaccine for HSV2. Even though from a public health point of view, it is clearly the more important target. One of the problems, and I will show you this, that HSV2 incidence in the U.S. is too low to do an efficacy trial. Global market is uncertain. Obviously, people that really need it won't be able to afford it at U.S. prices. It's another vaccine for STD, and here you can see Michelle Bachman talking about the HPV vaccine. I had a mother last night come up to me. She told me that her little daughter took that vaccine, that injection, and she suffered from mental retardation thereafter. So obviously, companies don't want to cause mental retardation um, among the young men and women, and. Uh, they are a little uh, skittish because of that. And of course, we do have some um, failures that um, have been shown. So how many uh, times have we tried and how many people were? Overall, there's been about 20,000 participants that have been enrolled in prophylactic vaccine trials. And most of the candidate vaccines have targeted the surface glycoproteins, mostly glycoprotein D2, although the Chiron vaccine also included uh, B2. These were subunit vaccines, and they elicited neutralizing antibodies. 
Now, the vaccine that has gotten further is what used to be the SKB or the GSK vaccine, Herpavac, is uh, what the big trial that I will be talking about uh, was called. But in an earlier study, which included two different populations, so they did two studies in parallel, and there were studies of discordant couples, of so one person had HSV2, and they vaccinated the person without HSV2 to see if they can prevent transmission. What they found is that the vaccine worked, sort of, among women who were seronegative. So it didn't work among men at all, and you can see this here, but it also didn't work among people who already had HSV-1 infection. It only worked among women who are already uh, seronegative, uh, who are still seronegative for both HSV-1 and HSV-2. The end point of this study was prevention of genital herpes disease and not prevention of infection, but it had efficacy that was uh, pretty high and statistically significant for prevention of genital herpes disease and borderline significant uh, third reduction for prevention of HSV2 infection. Now, because the primary endpoint was overall in all populations, the FDA would not approve this, but they've agreed for the company to go ahead and conduct another study in which would be done only on HSV seronegative women. And in fact, such a study was done. It was called Herpavac. It was the same vaccine. It enrolled more than 8,000 HSV seronegative women aged 18 to 30. Uh, the control vaccine was hepatitis A, and I'm just telling you that because you'll see it on the next slide, so you'll understand what the placebo was. It was a very long study and a very painful study to do. The primary endpoint was also disease and not infection. Um, there were 70 cases of genital herpes observed. Uh, 32 were HSV-1 and 38 were HSV-2, and there were 286 new HSV infections, and as you can see here, the majority of them was HSV-1 and not HSV-2, which was surprising to a lot of people. And uh, this is when you look at survival curves. So when we look at HSV-1 genital disease, this vaccine that had an HSV-2 um, antigen in it worked pretty well. It led to a, about a 70% reduction in HSV-1 uh, disease. But for HSV-2, which was the target of this vaccine, it had no efficacy. Okay. It worked well immunologically, meaning it caused an immune response. Um, as you can see, people boosted nicely at six months. And in red here, uh, you can see this is the response to the hepatitis A vaccine. Now, there was some suggestion early on that maybe if you had a higher um, antibody titer, you were more protected for HSV-1. And in fact, the study just recently came out, and it shows you here by antibody concentration. So this is low antibody concentration gets higher, and this is uh, the percent that acquired HSV-1. So you can see here, as your antibody um, levels got higher, you were less likely to acquire HSV-1. And this was a statistically significant slope. In contrast for HSV-2, uh, the slope really was not significantly different from zero. Um, you know, I can say there's a little bit, but clearly the line is flatter than it is for HSV-1, even though the vaccine used here used an uh, HSV-2 uh, product. And um, these are some of the modeling studies that these authors did to show that if we can really get very high ELISA titers, maybe we can protect against HSV-1. So this is the first time that we have a potential correlate against HSV-1 infection. Now, um, this is a really exciting study that um, actually just was published last week from uh, Harvey Friedman's uh, group at UPenn, where he was very curious about this issue, why the sera from vaccinees, uh, it looked like may protect H against HSV-1 better than HSV-2. So he did a series of studies looking, first of all, he looked at the correlation between the ELISA titers and neutralization titers. And you can see that at every level of the antibody by the ELISA uh, titers, there was 
greater neutralization for HSV1 than there was for HSV2. So the um, correlation between what we usually measure, which is the binding antibody, uh, was actually there was more neutralization per unit of binding antibody against HSV1 than against HSV2. But what you can see also here that the a percent of neutralization was much higher for HSV1 than HSV2. So when you look at the serum dilution, you can see uh, that the percent of neutralization starts lower, and even though these lines are parallel, um, it loses neutralization capacity um, because it starts at a lower point for HSV2 than for HSV1. So this response to this product neutralizes HSV1 better than HSV2. And now they, um, I think, also have some um, insights into why. So this is a picture of the surface of the virus with the glycoproteins. And this is glycoprotein, uh, uh, glycoprotein D. So this is D2. Uh, and this is G and um, I. And then this is uh, glycoprotein C. So as you can see for HSV1, there's good access of antibodies marked here in red to um, glycoprotein D. However, it looks like for HSV2, when you uh, make these structures, it looks like it might be hidden by these other glycoproteins that block access. So to prove this, he took wild type um, HSV1 and deleted um, glycoprotein C and then glycoprotein E. And as you can see, the degree of neutralization was not altered when you deleted those glycoproteins. However, when you took a wild-type HSV2, which you can see here, it neutralized not nearly as well as um, HSV1, and you deleted either GC or GE, you dramatically increased the ability to neutralize um, HSV2. Now, why would that be? Well, I told you before that HSV2 protects against HSV1, but HSV1 doesn't protect against HSV2. And this asymmetrical relationship has been puzz puzzling to me for a while. And I think the explanation is that if HSV1 protected against HSV2, you wouldn't have HSV2, because HSV2 arose second in the evolution. So it had to come up with a way to escape immunity against HSV1 in order to evolve. So I think this, uh, my hypothesis at this point is that uh, this is how HSV2 has managed to evolve by escaping HSV1-directed um, immunity, and in fact, people who already have HSV1. Now, let me uh, then talk a little bit about where we are with a prophylactic vaccine in the future and how we can approach this, because we also have a way of doing this. It turns out that HSV2 incidence in the Herpavax study uh, was only 1.1 1 .1 per 100 person years in the U.S. So it means that it's incredibly inefficient to do a clinical trial with such a low incidence because you will have to enroll thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And in fact, this is nicely illustrated in our local data. These are pregnant women who've delivered over the last 20 years at UWMC. And you can see here, um, this is the proportion that our HSV seronegative, and that has increased somewhat in the last 20 years. In yellow is the proportion that only has HSV1, and that also is a little bit higher, but you can see that between the blue and the red, so HSV2 alone, HSV1 and 2, uh, the proportion of women that have HSV2 has halved. Okay, so this is one local population, and even when this is adjusted for age, insurance status, etc., uh, this actually, um, I think, represents what is happening both in local population and at different rates nationwide. So where are we going to go to do prophylactic studies of HSV2? Well, we need to go where the disease is, and that is in Africa. And these are data that um, my student uh, just pulled together to look at uh, incidents in sub-Saharan Africa in various studies. And you can see here that the incidence is quite high. Um, most of the places, we don't know what it is. Uh, but really, it starts at two and goes substantially higher. And you can see here that for women, 
the median incidence in the studies is um, about uh, 12 to 13 percent, uh, and for men, it's about 6 percent. So clearly, these are populations in which a clinical trial can be done incredibly effectively because we will see endpoints. So I think the next prophylactic study of an HSV2 vaccine uh, will need to be done in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, so it won't take eight years again to get an answer whether or not the product is promising. Now, there are some challenges. Um, first of all, whether the endpoint should be clinical or um, infection. I think the FDA and most of the world looks at it differently at this point. So I, we hope to get engaged with them um, in the next year or so to try to define that a little bit further. It is also important that we need a vaccine that will work for HSV-1 seropositive people because most people in the world are already HSV-1 seropositive. Um, a vaccine that only protects women who are seronegative is really a vaccine for white suburban girls in the United States. And that's not where the need uh, really is. But if we do have a vaccine against HSV-1 also that protects against both 1 and 2, then maybe we should give it in childhood and protect against HSV-1 uh, acquisition as well. So I think that needs to be worked out. Now, there is now a precedent of FDA approving uh, uh, drugs based on studies that were done solely in Africa, and that is uh, Jared Baton's uh, PrEP study. And we also need to look at potential differences uh, in strains and whether um, the vaccine response to the potential vaccine might be different because of that. And finally, I think the first studies will need to decide whether we only will look at HSV2 as an endpoint or do a study that looks at HSV2 as well as subsequent HIV acquisition, especially, for example, in adolescent uh, young women in uh, South Africa whose incidence of HIV infection is still 5% uh, per year or higher. So these are the challenges, I think, that uh, lie ahead in terms of developing a good prophylactic vaccine. So I'm going to end here. Um, this is uh, the group that I uh, work with. Uh, special thanks to uh, Christine Johnston, who's become my right hand in the clinic. Of course, it means I'm her left hand, so I have to think about that a little bit. Um, and also, Amalia Margaret, uh, who's the biostatistician. And whenever I talk to drug companies who tell me that their biostatisticians came up with different numbers, I get to tell them, well, my biostatistician is better than your biostatistician. <laughs> Um, so, of course, and then laboratory collaborators, David Cole, um, Jia Zhu, Mei Li Huang, Larry Corey, uh, Rora Morrow, and um, the clinic staff. So, thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah. Sylvia. Let me get you a microphone so the other folks can hear. This is a suppressive therapy question in HIV infected women who are pregnant. And I'm mm -hmm. just wondering what you think, given the changing epidemiology of both genital ulcer disease as well as neonatal herpes, it's my understanding that HIV infected women in the U.S. are, off it, are offered suppressive therapy um, during pregnancy. Um, uh, if they're infected with HSV, if they have HSV2 antibodies. And I'm wondering, should we rethink that? And women with HSV1 antibodies, should they be offered suppressive therapy too? Um, I'm not sure why we're offering those women suppressive therapy to begin with. Okay, and there's actually some data to suggest that it doesn't protect against transmission of neonatal herpes. It does prevent them from having a C-section. Um, because it may prevent recurrences, but I'm not always sure that's the goal that we should be striving for, um, because C-sections actually protect against neonatal herpes. So I think this is, um, you know, a complicated issue, but I agree with you. Now, the other peculiarity of gentle HSV-1 is that it's actually more likely to be transmitted to the neonate when it's present in the genital tract. So even women with established gentle HSV-1 are more likely to infect their infants than women with established HSV2. So clearly there's some differences between those two types. Anna, I have a question for you. Um, 
I'm over here. <laughs> Thank Hi. You. Hi. Um, so you and I have talked about this before, but um, I'm just wondering, from a clinical standpoint, I, I know this is controversial, but what would your recommendations be for us as providers in counseling our patients who uh, are either undiagnosed and, and want to figure out if they've been exposed and infected with HSV-1 and HSV-2, and those patients who do have infection and are wondering, you know, what to do while they're waiting for a vaccine about reducing transmission to their partners? Mm -hmm. So there have been several things um, that have been shown to reduce transmission. None of them are 100%, so all of them partly reduce transmission, and we don't really understand very well how they interact. So it turns out that telling your partner that you have genital herpes uh, reduces the risk of transmission by 50%. <laughs> now, and I think that just because two brains are better than one, and there are two people paying attention uh, to things as opposed to just one person paying attention. Um, condoms also reduce transmission, also by about 50%. And then suppressive therapy with valacyclovir um, and probably other drugs as well, by reducing shedding, also reduces by about 50%. Um, and then not having sex when people are having lesions is the last thing that I uh, tell people. And that doesn't mean that you can use a condom when you have lesions to have sex. It means not having sex when you have lesions because we think the quantity of virus is higher um, at that point. So that was the easy question you asked. The much harder question to ask is when to test people uh, with serological tests. Um, and I think that when people come into STD clinic, in many populations, HSV is the most common um, STD that uh, the clinicians see but don't diagnose. Um, and yet we test all the time for things that are much, much uh, rarer. Um, so I think the very least people should be told when they come looking for an STD screen is uh, we should be telling them what we're not testing them for. And I also think that everybody who wants to be tested uh, for HSV-1 and 2 antibodies should be offered that opportunity. Not all the tests are uh, equally good that are currently on the market, but there are good tests and we can accurately tell people whether or not they have um, HSV-1 or HSV-2. And I'll tell you, most people that had transmit HSV-2, transmit when they didn't know that they have it, and most of them would have liked to know prior uh, that they could have done something to prevent transmission. Hunter? So, uh, the great presentation, Anna, thank you. Uh, patient selection issues is what I'm interested in about the vaccine. You mentioned you didn't take the ones with the most frequent occurrences uh, for obvious reasons that they may not be representative. On the other hand, if you take the entire spectrum of people with HSV2, you have a whole lot who have no symptoms at all. Uh, and if you can convince the FDA that on the basis of HIV protection, for example, you do need to look at infection outcomes in addition to clinical outcomes, uh, do you need to enroll a still less symptomatic group? And a related question is the um, uh, how long people have been infected. What's the difference in enrolling somebody who's been infected a year versus two years versus five? Older data from your clinic show that there's a gradual drop off in clinical recurrence frequency. Mm -hmm. What happens to people who are out 10, 15 years? What frequency do they have of subclinical shedding and what are the potential vaccine utility in those folks, particularly for HIV prevention? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really good question. Uh, I think in terms of the duration of infection, we see an inflection point at about one year. So people have very high shedding rates for the first year and then they sort of settle down pretty much for the next 10 years or so where they're going to be. There's this, maybe another small decrease about 10 years in, but it's not very dramatic. Um, so I don't think that certainly in the study design, which all these studies are done, the pre and the post within a pretty short period of time, I don't think that affects the validity of the uh, results. In terms of protection from HIV, I agree with you that for acquisition, infection is the right endpoint. Um, for a therapeutic vaccine, I think the question will be whether we can alter the immunologic cells that are in the genital um, area by having somebody not reactivate. So I agree with you that when we're asking that question, we will need to look at people who have uh, milder disease and maybe they are asymptomatic but shedding it also. Fred? 
maybe I, I misheard, but uh, are all the vaccines that have been studied subunit vaccines? Has anyone uh, investigated, uh, you know, live attenuated vaccines for them? So David Knipe um, ha is working with Sanofi Pasteur, and their vaccine is a, a deletion mutant. Uh, and they're looking at, they're doing phase one studies. Um, so it's a replication incompetent uh, mutant. And the phase one studies are ongoing. And just yesterday I talked with them about a, a therapeutic study design, a therapeutic vaccine study design. So that's the only one I know of. Thank you. Thank you.